Apparently people really wanted me to watch Mr. Nightmare. They all say Nuke Top 5 is baby shit. Mr. Nightmare is the real scary stuff. So you know what, let's prove that I'm not a little milk drinking, diaper pissing baby. We'll watch Mr. Nightmare. Let's do three creepy emails. If you ever check your spam folder in your email, there's a chance at one point you received an email with one of your passwords in the title, and inside the email would be threats of leaking your information, or worse, unless you paid a certain what does ransom, that have to do with ghosts? Bitcoin. This usually happens when a hacker, or even often a regular user, will likely find this info by merely searching any of the numerous data breach databases available on criminal forums. In March of 2019, a 25-year-old man named Joe Albanese received a similar email to what was just described. It was titled his password that he used for every account that he had. A ghost this was obviously hacker. obviously a cause for alarm, so he opened it immediately to read the contents of the email. This is what it said. Hey Joe, all you really need to know is that I know your password and other personal information. I won't come after you, I won't harm you, as long as you send me a small amount of money, $5,000, in the form of Bitcoin. Aww. We're going to refer to it as a donation for a good cause, not as any kind of blackmail. That's a good way of looking at it. The Bitcoin address is... If you don't send me the money, bad things may happen. Don't even bother going to the police. This email is untraceable. This has the same energy as a, as, as a call I got when I was like 22. I had just got an apartment. I was on my own. And like, the, it was pretty early. It was probably like the within the first month or two. I got a random fucking call from a dude. And he's like, hey, your mom just hit my brother with her car. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, mom, what are you doing? You, you can't, you're driving like shit out there. He's like, look, I'm going to need you to bring a lot of money to cover these medical bills, and I'm going to need you to bring it now. And then he gave me, like, a local gas station. And I was like, okay, Jesus Christ, all right, just please, oh my God, I'll, I'll call the police. And he's like, don't you dare call the police, I swear to God, I don't want to get violent. But what your mom just did to my brother is unforgivable, and I'm only going to allow this to slide if you bring the money to me now over at this gas station. I'm keeping your mom here, she's safe, she's fine. I was like, can I talk to her? Nope. And I was like, okay, this is getting fishy, but I was still panicked. And then eventually I was like, hey, just give me a second. And then I called my mom and she's like, hey, what's up, Charles? I was like, hey, mom, did you hit a kid with your car today? She's like, nope. <laughs> so then I went to the other guy. I was like, hey, man. And then I hung up. That shit works, though. I guarantee. I guarantee if I was like a year younger, not quite as wise as 22, I would have fallen for it. I went right to that gas station and got my ass beat. Then I would have been pissed at my mom. I'm like, man, mom, what the fuck? Joe did some research and learned that these kinds of threatening emails are common scams, and usually nothing will come of them. Still, Joe replied to the email asking, now? "What other personal information of mine do you currently possess?" Tier one, Vega I'd love boy. to know. And the he sent this as a sort Magnus. of challenge to the email, not even really expecting a response or for it to even go through, but it did. And he promptly received a response back saying, I know your home address is f If you go to the police, I will know about it and you will be sorry. This is when worry would really set in with just about anyone, as having a password leaked in a data breach is one thing, but some unknown person having your home address threatening you with it is completely next level. Joe didn't reply to the email for several days, but he also didn't go to the police. He decided to wait it out and see what would happen next, and after three days, there was a follow-up email saying, I'm still waiting for the payment. I won't wait much longer. Joe replied this time, saying, I'm not paying you $5,000. If you want to come to my <laughs> Damn, house, you get a Joe. lead. Ooh. This was a complete bluff, though, as he doesn't actually own a gun. And the hacker likely knew that, because that same night, Joe received a follow-up email containing a picture of his house. It was the side of his parents' house, and zoomed in on his bedroom window upstairs. He didn't want to tell his parents in fear of worrying them. But now that his gun bluff didn't work, he knew he may have to get them or the police involved. He's a tier one he responded one more Here's time saying, I don't have $5,000. I'm broke paying off student loans. The house you set a picture of is my parents' house. They did nothing wrong. If you need to do this, please do it to someone else. I don't have the money to send you even if I wanted to. There was no response this time, but within an hour, the sound of glass shattering from downstairs traveled throughout the house. And everyone including his parents heard it. 
There was one of their decorative bricks from the front of the house, laying a in the dining decorative room, decorative brick? thousands of tiny shards of glass from the fuck is this, window. Hitman? Joe tried to explain the situation as quickly as he brick? could, and while he and his dad took a quick look outside for anyone who could be out there, his mother called the police. Joe showed the police officers the emails and everything, which were forwarded to the police department. A police officer stayed parked outside the Albanese house for a couple hours that night. Joe blocked the email address from sending any further emails, and as far as he knew, he was never contacted again. The police had a hard time tracing back the original source of the email, as it was sent from an untraceable device, likely an iPod Touch or similar device. Very specific. Why an iPod Touch? At some point, touch? everyone imagines being famous in their lives. A Here's lot of people create this image in their head that being in the public eye creates for nothing but a fairy tale life. But that's far from the truth. Being under the spotlight in any capacity comes with a lot of drawbacks, one of which being stalkers and overly obsessed fans. One extreme case of this, an ex-radio host and DJ who was centered in Los Angeles had a long, seemingly never-ending chain of emails from an obsessed fan. It started around 2005 or 2006 when the DJ started noticing a regular listener, someone who listened to the show every day and would call in on the request line from time to time. At one point, the listener won a prize from the show, and in order to deliver the prize, the DJ requested her email, and that's where things began. In order to be polite and cordial with the girl, he would answer all of her emails, and when Facebook started to become popular, he added her back where she commonly liked and commented on his posts. This was a wholesome a while, story. Now they're married. One day the fan professed her love for him. Oh. The DJ rejected this advance in the most Aww. polite way he could. She seemingly accepted the rejection, and the DJ thought it would be the end of it, but it wasn't. In 2011, she emailed him a link to a blog that she was writing, where she would post Thanks about him glitched. and their quote-unquote love multiple times per day. She followed him over to a new radio station and was religiously listening to his shows, assigning meaning to the musical playlist. For example, the song Marry Me by Train was popular at the time, and whenever that song would play on his show, she would blog about it actually being a marriage proposal from the DJ. She began saving all his photos from his social media and photos of other women in his life, like friends and girlfriends, and posting them to her blog with extremely hateful words. She'd make posts raging about him being a man whore, followed by another Aww. post not even 10 minutes later in a completely different tone, apologetic and soft, implying she may have bipolar tendencies. He's a the smoker. DJ did his best to ignore it, even though Producer. by this point he was extremely creeped out. But as she again began emailing him, he tried more forcefully this time to get her to stop, but she wouldn't stop. The DJ started sending DMCA requests to her blog host from the photos of his that she had posted. The repeated violations got her blog shut down, but then she started emailing him instead of posting blogs. He made a filter folder so he never would have to see them aside from occasionally peeking at the insanity in the folder from time to time, just out of curiosity. Years went by and he hadn't answered any of her emails after two of them when he very adamantly told her to stop all communications and leave him alone. This continued for years, and in total, she has sent him over 4,000 emails, oh! all of which he's archived. This is a picture of just a select few of them. The more recent emails have gotten very dark and violent. Whoa, into hold on a minute. Damn. These are pretty intense. Oh. She made a typo. 4,000 emails. How many of them are full of typos? You kidding me? You got me fucked up. Shove it where the sun don't shine or according to In Mandy's vagina. Fuck off. Get lost, Janet motherfucking Jackson. Kiss my ass. Well, yeah, this is, this is just mental illness. Yeah, that's rough. Tone. In one of the most recent ones, she was threatening to find and hurt the DJ and happily go to jail for it. In another one, she listed the specific neighborhood in which he lived, which he worries she may have his address if she already knew what town he lives in. In an effort to stem the flow of information, he deleted all of his social media accounts a while back, but she would still email him pictures he appeared in from his friends who had public profiles, as well as radio station photos that he appeared in. Most disturbingly, she sent the DJ photos of a shrine she had made of him in her home with framed photos of his Good social picture media to that use. posted up on the walls, desks, etc. Hell yeah. Being a DJ, his appearance schedule must remain public, so she could technically find him working at nightclubs anytime she wants to, and understandably, he's freaked out and worried he's about his safety. Criminal. After calling multiple attorneys, none seemed very interested in helping him with this matter. 
Due to his fear of facing the girl in real life or even being in the same room as her, mm -hmm. he never went through with filing a restraining order. He also worried that on the off chance she didn't have his home address, the legal process would reveal so. it to her. To my knowledge, Probably there was like. never any follow-up with this, and it's not known if the harassment continued or what route the DJ pursued, if any. But this is one of those extreme cases of how a fan's obsession could have a very negative effect on someone's well-being and mental health. In this last one, a viewer who wanted to be referred to as Christian received multiple emails that he wanted me to share in a story video. Christian has a friend named Katie who was out for a job interview. They used to be co-workers, which is how they met. Nothing was out of the ordinary until Christian started to try and contact Katie after her interview was supposed to be done. He's a prime find that his texts weren't delivering and calls were going straight to voicemail. It was very possible that her phone could have been off or she had no cell service. But as hours passed and still nothing was delivering, he started to get concerned. The most likely and obvious possibility was that she lost or broke her phone. But finally, hours later, the text said delivered. However, Kate never replied. That same day, as Christian was checking his email, he saw an email from Katie's old work email. He opened it, and it read, Hey, I lost my phone and keys. Can you come pick me up? And buy oh, some old no. warehouse construction looking building in the parking lot across from a Hyatt place. It's a trap. Christian asked when she last had her phone and if she had any idea how she lost it. She replied, I have no idea. Just come soon, please. It's cold. The address that she then sent to better help Christian get to her said it was 20 minutes away. But looking at the location of the address on the map, it led to some abandoned looking warehouse parking lot, evident by the green growing in the parking lot and decaying looking rooftop. Christian sent another email back, demanding she go to a less Thank sketchy pickup son. point. She took a few minutes to answer back with, I'm already sitting on a bench here. I'm comfortable, just please hurry. <laughs> Christian got in his car and started following the directions Damn. to the location he was told to go. But about halfway there, he stopped the car when he had a thought. And that was, how was she using her laptop to email him in the middle of some random parking lot by an abandoned warehouse? While it was maybe possible that there was some free optimum Wi-Fi nearby or something, it did seem very unlikely. This is where Christian became suspicious of the whole thing, and the fact that she was using her laptop to contact him instead of going to the hotel across the street and calling him just made it seem more suspicious. He tried calling her number a few times, and now it was ringing instead of going to voicemail. On his third try, the phone rang twice and somebody picked up for a second, though most likely on accident. By this point, Christian was suspicious all of Katie's things were stolen. He called Katie's brother to tell him about the situation and ask his opinion. Chris, kind of smart. Asked, first thing, have you heard from Katie? Katie's brother said she had been home for two hours and that her entire backpack and phone were stolen. Christian yelled into the phone that he was being led into some sketchy parking lot at that very moment by someone who was on Katie's email, most likely on her laptop. Christian drove to Katie's house immediately to pick the two of them up, and they called her but phone and left a voice. But it was an elaborate trap. All three of them yelling threats of what they the real Katie if they was at the bench. The phone and laptop. Those were the criminals. Probably went unheard if the thief didn't have her passcode. They also sent a number of texts, which went unresponded to. After calling the police and requesting assistance in the parking lot, a police car did show up, but the entire parking lot was abandoned as expected, and no further emails were received. Kate's phone was never turned on again. One drop. It was likely disposed of. She never got any of her stuff back, but on the bright side, Christian may have avoided being lured into some kind of trap that would have led to him being robbed or harmed. Yep, true. Good work, Christian. Well, there was nothing paranormal there, so it wasn't scary. No ghosts, no spooks.